So at my age, which is considerable, I managed to do more than most folks would ever do to follow their dream. I had a goal, I set it, I followed it, I, I fulfilled every, every possible ambition I could possibly have had that was worth having, and believe me, I specialise in the impossible. So from 1977 till 19, no, till now, till 2014, I have filled every minute of every day with every dream that I could possibly want to see fulfilled, and I've fulfilled it. So I'm telling you now, don't lose your opportunity, this is it. You're only going to get this one time to do it, and I suggest you do it right now. I've got a story that will knock your socks off. Um, my name is Jack Potter, and I've travelled around Australia for 45 years. I've been through every bush town, every camp, every community, Aboriginal town, everything you could imagine, and I have done some stuff that you will find hard to believe, but I'm telling you now, absolutely, it happened. But I went into the big smoke, went into the industry, and jumped ship as quick as I could, and, and went over to England, worked for everywhere in London, from Buckingham Palace, met all the people you would imagine you'd never get a chance to meet. I met the, the Beatles, used to come to my house, I used to see everybody that was anybody, and, they, and I had, a, at the same time, ran at a health food shop that is a legend in, in London. It was the only health food shop that anyone would ever say, this, the New York Times, in fact, used to say, this is the only man in London you can trust. I had everything biodynamic, amazing stuff. No pills, no potions, all food, all veg, ice creams, you name it. And I started it for 25 bucks, and within six months, I was serving 800 customers a day. But sometimes it's hard to tell a story without mentioning somebody with whom one comes up against. Those who know the world of music will know the name of Yehudi Menuhin. Now some will say, who the hell is that? Well no, he was the world class violin performer who had a sister called Hepzibah who played the piano for him. Now Hepzibah used to live in Chelsea and I used to deliver health foods. I used to do my own delivery service down to Chelsea, all over London, delivering these beautiful foods. And when I would go to Hepzibah's house, she would say, come on in, we're having dinner. And we became buddies. And we would sit on the floor, all these famous opera stars and musicians, all sitting on the floor of Hepzibah Menuhin house. And she would introduce us by first names. Jack, this is Victoria. Oh yeah? Victoria, hello. What's, what's your real name? De Los Angeles ago. Oh wow, I'm sitting on the floor with all these people. Everyone was like that. I had movie stars, I had the people, the people who made the biggest television programs on television and in film in those days. The James Bond movies, the people. I remember there was a puppet show thing called The Thunderbirds. Wow, they all they all came to our place. And it was just terrific the way London was filled with famous people, all of whom would come to our shop. Benjamin Britten, with his boyfriend Peter Pierce, they come to our, our shop, and the Royal Shakespeare Company, they would sit in the back of our shop. We weren't supposed to drink wine in the health food shop, but we did. And we would sit in the back of the, the, the my beautiful health food shop, and we were all laughing after they'd been rehearsing at the space. It was a rehearsal room through the club. So we had the Royal Shakespeare coming. There was one fella, I remember him well, called Stephen Burkoff. You see him, he's a villain in the, in the Die Hard movies. He used to come in there and we always treated everybody just as us, one of us. That's what London was. You didn't have to say, oh, so you're so and so. Whoa, no, you didn't. And the fact that we could be like that gave us some cachet, I guess, because everyone would be able to come in and just be themselves. And Harold Pinter, the playwright, he, he lived nearby, so did his secretary, and she was married to, to Roger Lloyd Pack. Now, I don't know whether you watch the Vicar of Dibley, the tall, lugubrious guy. Yeah, that's Roger. The, that would, that everyone came to our shop or our house, but that wasn't that we were special, that was just that that was what London was. It was like a roller coaster, but it had no brakes. What a life. I never could have ever imagined that I would have had the guts, indeed, that I would have had the balls to do what I did. 
and I came back out from England to do a big rock and roll show called Jesus Christ Superstar. If you look me up on the books, you'll see me there. My name's there, but I went bush. I couldn't stand the entertainment industry. It was full of all the kind of people you'd never let your children get to. So I built my own rig, took my wife and little boy, and we hit the track. And in doing that, we encountered bushfires, taipan snakes, every kind of mongrel, every kind of difficulty, every kind of hazard you could possibly imagine. We chartered a plane, 27 days. The first and the second day of the trip around Australia for 27 days, we hired a pilot who brought us down in the Simpson Desert twice out of fuel, twice. Not just the first day, but the second day. How can you hire a pilot who doesn't know, even know what fuel he's got in the plane? We did, we did. It was all, it, it was the name of the game. Round through, back to Perth, and, to, and working again from Perth, I eventually came to settle in Northern. It is something that is raucous, funny, boisterous, wild, uncontrollable sometimes, but it is, an, and it, often, it's been a series of nightmares you could ever have to deal with, but we did it. And not only that, we set a real standard so that I could say now, there would be hundreds of thousands of people around the bush in Australia who would say, yeah, I saw a play once. There was this guy came into town, he put on a keg of beer, and holy smoke, did he crack, crack the whip, and we did. We went from the border of Queensland, a little town called Texas. I was there, yeah, well there's a Texas in Australia, and that's where I was born. After that, I came back out here, went and did my thing, went around, loaded up, built a stage, didn't know which end of a hammer to hold to hit. But I built a magnificent stage, which loaded down like a Chinese puzzle into a truck, so that I could not only load the stage, unload it, put it up, do the show, greet the guests, learn how to promote it, and get the community to really enjoy themselves without having to use grossness and lang language and filth and, 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 and I didn't have to drop my standards at all. And I've never been acknowledged, and you know what? I couldn't give a rats. And I live in a country town now, and I'm sort of, I'm doing my best to write my book and tell, it, tell the tale of what it's like to follow your dream. If you have a dream and you don't follow it, you've got rocks in your head. I had the toughest, most impossible dream to ever achieve, and my dream was to go around Australia 40 years later, doing what I love doing best, and I did it. And cut. <laughs>